Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is the first of the webinar series from the Global Legal Blockchain Consortium. Uh, today, we have Glenna Christian from Oric, who is going to be talking with us about Blockchain 101. Glenna? Thanks, Kelly. Hi, all. Thank you for joining today. Um, I'm Glenna Christian, as Kelly mentioned. I'm the co-head of the Global Tech Transactions at Oric, Harrington & Sutcliffe. Um, and we've been working with, you know, blockchain companies for the last, you know, year and a half or so, and really working with the Global Legal Blockchain Consortium and Integra Ledger since their founding last year. I can't believe it's really only been a year. Um, but this is really starting to grow and snowball like crazy. Um, you know, earlier in this year doing these presentations, there was always questions about, well, where is the there there? Sounds like a lot of hype do I really need to worry about it? I don't see the use cases for it. And every day there's a new use case or we see a new uh, company that is starting up based on blockchain or even larger companies that are looking to pilot their own blockchain solutions. So it's definitely there and it's time to really put the hype aside a little bit and try to understand what it is. Um, typically um, when you read or hear about blockchain, particularly from the technology set, we spend a lot of time talking about um, buzzwords, that it's decentralized, um, it's immutable, um, and it's super secure. So from a legal standpoint, you don't really need to worry about it. So I wanna talk a little bit about those things, but really step back even more basic than that, because from my standpoint, I really just need to understand what the blockchain is before I can even worry about the attributes of it and whether they're they are helpful or not from a legal standpoint. Um, and it's really hard to find information about what blockchain actually is. And in my mind, I literally have to think about it simply as a network. Um, and it's really helpful for me sometimes when I hear somebody describing what their business model is or their solution is using blockchain. If I will simply take the word blockchain and swap network in it, listening to their description, then it's a good reminder that we're, that we're really talking about another network um, that is driven off of software, servers, and databases. And when you start thinking about a blockchain in that way, then it helps you understand or start to think through the different legal issues that may that may come up from it. Now, um, even though it's a network and at the end of the day it is software servers and a databases, the reason why it's getting so much attention now is because it does have special characteristics that say a cloud services network or your own private network may not have. And those are the things that are really beneficial that our people are looking forward to. Now, as we're going through this, please feel free to um, ask questions because it's just helpful to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the fact that a, a blockchain is decentralized and that's one of the sort of key features of a blockchain network. And what that really means is that there's no, you know, central um, data center where all of the information in the servers and the so servers and the software is stored. So unlike cloud services, where maybe you have your application and your data residing in an AWS um, data center, if you're using a blockchain, then anybody that's participating on the blockchain has been able to download the software onto their servers and they can store data from that network. And the software will control how, it, how the blockchain functions. But that means it's really spread out across everybody that participates. And you may or may not know who those participants are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. Um, so on the slide that I, I have up, for example, it mentions that there may be thousands or even millions of computer users. That's really in the case of a public blockchain, um, an example of which is the blockchain that supports Bitcoin there are lots of thousands of computers that are that are involved in that blockchain network that's running Bitcoin. The advantages of that is that it makes it a much stronger network. If you take one computer out of that network, the entire network isn't going to go down. So from an availability standpoint, that really 
um, is one of the big benefits of decentralization. It also tends to be more transparent because anybody who's participating in the blockchain has um, the same access to that information, at least particularly on the public blockchain. So the decentralization is one of the key sort of features of this type of network, unlike other networks such as cloud services. The other sort of key feature that you hear frequently when you're talking about a blockchain network is really that it's immutable. It's an immutable ledger. And what that means is when data is stored in a database participating in the blockchain, it's um, recorded in a way that you're unable to go back and modify it. Now, that's true most of the time, but not necessarily depending on how the particular blockchain may work. So when you hear somebody talking about a blockchain being immutable, keep in mind that you need to ask the questions about what type of blockchain it is. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But you frequently will hear engineers talk about how blockchain is amazing and, and it's really great for use cases where you wanna make sure that information can't be altered down the road. It's a permanent digital record of that, that information. Um, and that also helps lend to um, authenticity and that um, data being stored um, really being trusted and, and serving purposes for validation. So the decentralization and the immutability of a blockchain network are really some of the two key features of being able to use and why you would use blockchain as opposed to using like a cloud services network. The one thing that I do want you to keep in mind though when you're thinking about these features is that it really depends on the type of blockchain you're talking about. Now, it's, it's a little bit of a misconception that there's one blockchain. Um, it's because it's a network, there may be lots of blockchains. Um, the first really, as I mentioned, was the blockchain that runs, the, runs Bitcoin. But there's public blockchains which are permissionless and anybody can download the software and participate on that blockchain, and then there are private. So it's important to understand what blockchain you're talking about and how that operates. So the public blockchain, as I mentioned, is one where it's pretty much open for anybody who wants to participate. You literally just need to download the software, make sure you're following the rules for using that software. It also means it's anonymous, so you don't, know who else is participating in that network with you and you don't know their identity. From a, from a Bitcoin or a crypto standpoint, in order to, to uh, sync the data, then each participant in the blockchain will have to solve a complex um, cryptographic problem in order to, to store it on the blockchain. You see that as proof of work, you hear about mining. That's really in a, in a very Bitcoin crypto context. And that's not necessarily true for all blockchains. So that's important to understand the process and the requirements in order to store um, data on a particular blockchain. Um, one of the things I think to keep in mind when you're talking about a public blockchain is that it is decentralized and it's an anonymous. So from a compliance with law standpoint, it may not be the one that um, is the most appropriate for a particular business use case. So for example, if you have a use case where you're looking to store personal information on a blockchain, it may be tough to reconcile requirements um, with GDPR, for example, with storing data that's publicly available. It's also maybe difficult to comply with things like OFAC, where you need to know who it is you're transacting business with um, when you're on a public blockchain and you don't know who all the participants are. So it's important to understand if you're dealing with a public blockchain. Um, another type of blockchain that I mentioned is, is the private blockchain or a hybrid of that. And in these situations, they're closely controlled or, or maybe controlled by a consortium or have um, much more visibility into who the participants are on that blockchain. Um, you're seeing more and more consortiums um, that um, that will run a private blockchain. These are also distributed ledgers um, as well and may not be a true blockchain. But in these cases, either the consortium or the rules that govern how a, a private blockchain operates um, will tell you what you can and can't do with it. 
including whether you can go back and change information on that blockchain. Um, there's different types of software programs um, that run blockchains. For example, Ethereum and Hyperledger are two of the most common ones. And you tend to see those really in public blockchains. Um, in the private blockchains, you may see proprietary software or a mix of both open source and proprietary software. So if you're looking at a use case where your business team wants to uh, use a solution that is run off a of blockchain, not only do you want to know whether it's run off a of public blockchain or a private permission blockchain or distributed ledger technology, You'll want to understand a little bit about the software that you'll be downloading as well. Is it open source? Is it proprietary? What are the license terms? Um, this is an area that not a lot of blockchains have spent much time on. You see it a little bit more though, really in the private. They're starting to think through what those license terms ought to look like. Um, just a little bit of a picture of a way a blockchain transaction um, will work where somebody may request a transaction then it's going to get broadcast out to all of the participants in the blockchain. Um, and when I talk about a participant in a blockchain, um, you may hear those referred to as nodes. Um, so the computers who are participating in the blockchain are frequently just referred as nodes. It's a little bit of a telecom concept as well, um, but getting the lingo down with blockchain is, is part, of the, part of the issue here too. But if you hear nodes, just think of it as just a participant in, in the network. Uh, depending on how that blockchain operates, there'll be a validation process to validate the transaction and the participant status. Um, and that's usually done through algorithms that are, are set up in the particular blockchain. Then the transaction can be verified and stored to the data in the ledger. Um, I mentioned that there are differences between the blockchain. So, for example, you see lots of different use cases coming out now. Some of these are public blockchains and some of them are private. Um, and the transactions are going to be validated in different ways. But mostly we're seeing it now in real estate with respect to medical records. Um, there are some states that are looking into using blockchain not only for voting but for issuing IDs. Um, for driver's licenses, birth certificates, um, those sorts of information, tracking IP licenses with an algorithm that will determine how royalties should be paid, supply chain information. Walmart has recently announced that it's using a blockchain um, with IBM in order to track produce through its system. Proof of insurance is another example. So there are lots of situations now where you're seeing different uses of blockchains, both public and private, to track and validate certain information. Um, and all of that can be done through the process that I, that I just mentioned. But you'll wanna understand how that particular blockchain will validate that transaction for your particular use case. Um, now there are some trade-offs depending on whether it's a public blockchain or a private blockchain. As you can imagine with its public and you can have as many people participate as possible, you're getting the most decentralization um, and that really helps scale the blockchain. Um, the downside of that, though, means it's um, less private um, and um, you may have more issues in terms of making sure you're complying with law. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but there's definitely um, some trade off depending on the types of blockchains that you're using. When it's more centralized, which tends to be private blockchains, then there are more rules around what you can and can't do with that blockchain, um, which means tighter control. And that may or may not be a good thing, depending on what your use case is, who the other individual participants are. So, you know, as opposed to a public blockchain where it's completely decentralized and there's really no central governing authority, private blockchains tend to be a little more closely run with more rules around what you can and can't do. Um, for a corporate enterprise type solution, that may end up being the best option. Um, that it's not what some of the blockchain purists think is the true benefits of a blockchain. There is, as you can imagine, lots of issues um, that to be thought through when you're using it, looking at using blockchains. 
Um, some of them are really particularly focused around crypto, um, and we can do a separate presentation really on the different issues that come up with crypto. And I want to just highlight some of those so you can be thinking about them because many of the use cases you will see now, um, whether it's a public or a private blockchain, include some use of a utility token. So I at least want to make sure that you're aware of some of the issues around using tokens. Um, this is something that's really being paid attention um, to by lots of different um, agencies. As you can see from the little card on the screen, as crypto is considered to be property by the IRS, the Treasury views it to be money, the CFTC is looking at it as a commodity, and the SEC will view it as a security. So lots of different regulatory issues to think about when there's a token involved. Some of these are just making sure um, that you're complying with anti-money laundering laws. Um, I mentioned OFAC earlier. That's another one that um, you still need to make sure that you're complying with. Um, money transmitting licenses are a sneaky way that um, some of the blockchain companies are, are finding they're, they're tripping over because they end up being a, a money transmitter under all 50 states and their licensing requirements. So when you're using a token, you still need to make sure that you've thought through all of these, these sorts of issues. Um, I mentioned CFTC is regulating tokens um, as a commodity. The SEC is um, looking at it um, as a security. If you remember from law school days, there was a decision called Howey that looked at whether a security was an investment contract that's not just limited to money um, and includes, um, includes things like tokens. So we're having to go back and, and relook at some case law that's been around for a while. Howey was a, a case that was based on an orange grove in Florida and whether or not there was an investment contract related to that. So we've gone from citrus groves in Florida to tokens um, in blockchain. Um, from a more corporate enterprise standpoint and, and solutions um, that may run off of a blockchain network, there are lots of other issues to think about that are sort of part of your normal review um, of using a product that has a, a network component. Um, so, for example, um, where is the tax jurisdiction going to be in a particular transaction? This is much more difficult to determine if you're working off of a public blockchain where you don't know where the other parties are to the transaction. There's really no way for you to know what jurisdiction they're in and where taxes may be due. So if you're really looking at a solution where you need to make sure that all the appropriate taxes are being paid, then a private blockchain is probably going to be a better solution where you have visibility into who the individuals are that are participating on the network, what jurisdictions they're in. Um, intellectual property, um, there's some questions about whether a blockchain network can be owned. Um, obviously, there are issues around the software um, that you download, making sure you've got appropriate licenses for that. Um, if you're participating in a blockchain, there'll be data generated around that blockchain and how it's used, who actually has the rights to that. Um, that may be easier to determine if it's in a private blockchain versus in a public blockchain. So various intellectual property issues around how that network is being used um, and the information generated from that. Um, and I trust um, is another one to think about as well, not only in terms of participating in a consortium, and whether you need to worry about it, much like any standards organization. But if you're participating in a blockchain where you're sharing information, such as possibly pricing information with other participants, that may be sort of an indirect um, way of colluding, whether it's direct or indirect. So there are things to even think about from an antitrust standpoint, depending on how you're using a particular blockchain and who the other participants are. Um, smart contracts are one that people are spending more time starting to think about now. Smart contracts are, are nothing new. They've been around for a long time now, and they're really just um, digitized processes, um, automatic processes. So one of the earliest examples is the code that runs vending machines. You put your dollar in, you push a three, the machine spits out the bottle of water for you. The code that says, all right, they put a three in, that means it's this particular bottle of water, they've paid the appropriate amount. It's automating that process. 
Now, back in the mid 90s, we weren't really thinking about smart contracts or worrying about if there were legal issues associated with that. But because blockchain now enables that code to be distributed on a broader basis, smart contracts can be hosted on top of a blockchain to really automate even more processes. And that's really some of the advantages around using a blockchain network. You can really think of smart contracts is just the applications, the software that's sitting on top of that network. Um, you may hear engineers talk about smart contracts as being um, code as law, and that, that it's really in essence a contract, but most likely, um, depending on how it is used um, and the functions that it performed, it may not be a true legally enforceable contract, meeting all the typical requirements of a contract. Um, the, one of the other things to think about that I've, that I've seen um, some companies offering blockchain solutions do um, is really um, making a lot of claims around what the network can and can't do. And particularly because um, some of the advantages are that it's immutable and that it's stored in the blockchain possibly indefinitely, I've seen lots of companies making claims that it's immutable perpetually. And I think at the end of the day, you want to make sure that everybody's understanding that while this is a blockchain network and there may be lots of people participating on it, really at the end of the day, we're still talking software servers and databases. And I haven't seen a network yet that is perpetual. So if you're advising clients around a solution um, that's based on blockchain and how they're marketing it, you'll really want to think through from an advertising and a complying with all of the Federal Trade Commission's requirements um, around the type of marketing claims that they're making. Um, just a couple of other um, points and then I'll go to some questions that were raised. Um, I think probably one of the biggest issues, at least from my perspective, that I think about in using blockchain, and I think this is one of the questions that come up, is really things like data privacy. And how do you make sure you're complying with all the data privacy requirements? And this is probably heightened for everybody right now, given GDPR's rollout in May and the upcoming California consumer legislation. Um, and honestly, I haven't been able to reconcile how you use a public blockchain um, with personal information and making sure you're complying with um, all the data privacy requirements that you have. In a public blockchain, if you're storing personal information, um, you could be putting that information then in the hands of third parties all across the world whose identity you don't know. Um, that makes it really difficult to make sure that you're controlling the data you're minimizing um, the amount of information that's available. So one of the requirements of GDPR, for example, is making sure that you're minimizing the, the data and its usage. You also have to be thinking about um, international transfers and you're, if you're complying with the requirements to transfer data out of particular jurisdictions. So there are lots of different things um, about the way a public blockchain operates that make it difficult to comply with something like GDPR. That doesn't mean that you can't use a blockchain solution um, or that you shouldn't think about it. Um, and what we tend to see clients focusing on right now are really looking at private um, blockchain solutions or keeping data off chain and then storing hashes um, on the public blockchain. So they're not actually putting personal information on the blockchain. And it really depends on the particular solution, what they're trying to accomplish, um, where the, you know, who will be able to participate on the blockchain if they have visibility into that and how they may be able to control it. There are also lots of the things that come up as you're thinking about contracting um, around blockchain, particularly on the data privacy side. Um, it, it, and even basic things like, for example, the agreement that you would typically have if you're looking to acquire a solution, any type of cloud-based or internet access solution will have confidentiality terms. An exception to what's confidential information tends to include information that is publicly disclosed. If you're putting information in a public blockchain, then you may have just accepted that information out of all of your confidentiality provisions. So there are lots of different things in addition to data privacy to think about um, 
just in terms of contracting when you're really looking at a, at a public blockchain. Um, as I mentioned, blockchain is really a way that a lot of our clients in a more enterprise um, based um, company um, or solution are, are really looking. Um, the one thing to think about though is sometimes even if you're doing off chain and you're simply storing a hash, um, which is the key, if you can think of a hash really as just a super password. Um, it's important to make sure you don't lose that password, but it's really a password that will allow access to the data. And even if you're storing the hash, sometimes there may be made metadata on it. So you'll want to make sure you thought through what that metadata is as well and that it doesn't include any personal information. Um, let me just see what else I have here and then we'll go to some questions. I want to leave a little bit of time. I know we're trying to run, we're running a little bit out. Um, so on the key takeaways, and then we'll get to the questions. Um, really think through the data privacy issues. Make sure that you understand that blockchains are both public and private networks, and those can be entirely different. Um, you'll want to understand how the particular architecture is working, just like any other network. Um, and you'll really probably see it being used in connection with a smart contract in order to automate processes. Um, and I think one of the questions we had is whether smart contracts will become a dominant model around contracting in the future, or if they're going to be really more narrow segments, like around the, the Walmart example and supply chain management. And at least for now, I think the consensus is really that smart contracts are still going to be pretty narrow um, and only apply to very simple processes that may be automated. In some situations, you may be able to make those entire contracts themselves, but those will have to be very simple situations where you can have if-then obligations that you can easily translate into code. So on one hand, you may have those if-then statements translated into code and have that be entirely outside of the contract, much like in the vending machine example, that there's no contract around your use of that vending machine that operates on its own. Or if it's a simple enough contract, then you may be able to have that be the entire contract itself, just that limited code. But for most of what I do, and at least most of my clients, particularly on an enterprise basis, and even if you're a company that's offering a blockchain-based solution, most likely there are going to be terms that just aren't something that you can put into code, an if-then statement. For example, commercially reasonable, really hard to put that into an objective code statement. Um, while you can have indemnification that's in code, the scope of that indemnification is very difficult to put into code. So I think at least for the near future, smart contracts will be limited to being possibly pieces of a contract that you might incorporate by reference, but would still need that overall contract around it. And that overall contract will look a lot like your standard master services agreements now, with adjustments, like I mentioned earlier, for using a network that's blockchain based. For example, relook at your definition of confidential information, relook at what happens on termination, because your data will still be in the blockchain even after you stop using the services. Um, one of the things that I, that is another question I just want to mention quickly, because I know we're, we're just about out of time here, is really around um, the hacking of blockchains. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of thought that because it's a blockchain and it's so decentralized and it's a mutable record that it can't be hacked and that makes it more secure. There are situations in which not necessarily the blockchain itself has been hacked, but if you remember, blockchains are still dependent on software, servers and databases. And there have been situations where there has been hacking, but that really um, gets to where there's been vulnerabilities in the software or the access onto the blockchain. So there are still ways that you need to access the network, just like you do now, that are vulnerable to hacking as well. So you still wanna make sure that you're realizing that it's a network and it's still a network that's based off software servers and databases. And while it may be decentralized and more people involved, so if a part of that network goes down, the whole network doesn't, it doesn't mean that it might not still be vulnerable. So you still want to think about the types of information that you're putting across that nodes. 
Um, so that's, I think we're just about out of time now. Um, you know, we've been seeing blockchain in our practice really grow significantly, particularly this year. Um, unlike cloud services, which seemed like it was on a little bit of a slow burn for the last several years, I even had a client just this morning call me and tell me that they're really now looking at the policies and the processes they need to put in place to start using cloud services. Um, blockchain is really taking off and, and hawking sticking. And so we've gone from not really talking about blockchain at all a year and a half ago, um, except maybe in a crypto context, to thinking and talking about it on an almost daily basis, both from startup technology companies that wanna just move right to using blockchain as their main network for providing their solution, to larger enterprise companies that are running pilots in um, multiple areas to find ways that they can use blockchain. Um, so that's, I think, all we have for today. Happy to answer any other questions. Always feel free to email me. I'm at gchristian at auric.com, or feel free to call me as well. Thank you, Glenna. We really appreciate your time and want to thank everybody who joined us for this webinar, and we hope to see everybody at a future GLBC webinar. Thank you.